Azrat, and he will be talking on the graded structure of Levit Kath Alphabet. So first of all, thanks very much for the opportunity. I would want to thank Rebeo for his big mic on. I just talk now. I'm going to talk about the graded theory that sits on the top of the Vipath algebra, and I, I'm going to start with uh, two examples of Rangra. So, if you look at two graphs, these are very simple, innocent looking graphs, and we can actually compute to the Vipath algebra associated to these graphs. So, and it's very easy that the game you play is. You look at the sink, so the sink means there's nothing going out. So you look at the sink, and you count all the paths ending at this sink. So this is the sink, just count all the paths ending here. So one, when you're sitting on it, this is the second one, and this is the third path. So there are three paths ending here. So then there's a big path algebra, with just three by three matrices that are in your field. So this is the coefficient field we start with. So let's try the other one. The same game, you look at the sink and count all the paths ending. <coughs> so one, two, and three. So the Levine path algebra associated with this one is also a three by three matrix over this coefficient field. Should I put K? Can all right, so I put, I mean, I deliberately put F because I don't want to mix with. You use that for me. Ah, oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay. I put K, but you know I just don't want to mix it with K groups. But yeah, right, absolutely. All right, so my coefficients are uh, coming from a field K. All right, so now that's good. But now there is a, there is a little problem here. I think the weak path algebra apparently cannot see the link that you travel along the graph. Look. Here, you can travel two steps. Here, the maximum you can travel is just one. But the Levit path algebras are the same. So when you get this form to L, it's blind. It doesn't see the length that you travel. Okay. So, so the main question is, can I carry over more information from this graph into these algebras? So let me give you more examples. Um, look at this graph now. So just a simple path connecting to this cycle of length one, so it's a loop. How about this one? Again, you have a cycle, just one single cycle, and stuff coming toward through the cycle. One more example. So you see this one is different than this. Again, one cycle, two things are coming to this edge, and finally just one simple cycle. All right, so these are the graphs, and I can compute that the big path algebra is associated to these graphs. In fact, these are called comet graphs. So these are acyclic graphs. So that means there are no cycles here. But here you have cycles. But the type R, so you have just one single cycle, and everything is coming towards that. So it's like a comet. So that's why they call it comet graphs. So let me call this E1, E2, E3, and E4. And again, there is another paper by Jean and Jean Evans on Mermaid Fitness, which is, she's not here. But they also tell you how to calculate the Levine path algebras of these comet graphs. And again, the, the game is very simple. You just remove, you look at the cycle, you remove this path or <coughs> edge. So you remove one edge from the cycle. What you end up with is a cyclic now. There are no cycles anymore. So I killed the cycle. Now play the same game here. Look at this sink. Now this is your sink. Nothing going out of this. And count all the paths ending here. So one, two, three, and this path of length two, four. Oops, one, two, three, four. So I get M four of K. Right. Let's do this one. Again, you remove one edge from the cycle. Here you have only one edge, so remove that. 
you end up with an acyclic graph and then count all the fats, which is again M4. Do this here, M4, this could be as an exercise. Again, here you see M4. So the big path algebra associated to these graphs, they are all, again, 4 by 4 matrices over K. But look, the graphs are very different. This one is very symmetric. This is not. It's very different graphs, but you get the same Levy path algebra. So the same question, can I carry over more information from the graph onto the Levy path algebra that we distinguish more? Why is the, why does the extra thing not matter? I mean, you, you counted. Because I made a mistake. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, so now the difference, great question. So here, the field doesn't appear, in, uh, the Laurent ring appears. So this is a Laurent ring. Now, if you wonder why I would get the Laurent ring x, well, the informal description would be look, here you're allowed to do one cycle. That represents x. X. If you do twice, that would be x to the power of 2, 3 times <coughs> x to the power of 3, but you're allowed to go backward also, so that represents x minus 1. That's why, so if informal justification why these Laurent rings appear. Alright. And if you bring two different, then two No, 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 you never get the Laurent, so that's the thing. You never get, in the big path algebra, you never get the Laurent with two variables. Then you have to go to higher rank graphs, this function and path, then you can get this. So, yeah. All right, so two types of examples. The graphs are very different, but the big path algebra are the same. So, how can I pass more information from graphs into the path algebra thing? Especially the length, okay. So this is the, again, informal justification of what I'm gonna do. Look, imagine you have this edge, so this is the edge of length 1. So if you're living path algebra, I call it L. Let me call it M1. These are all the paths of length 1, OK? Now, here you have a path of length 2. Let me call it L2. So now, if I multiply in the algebra this and this, I get this path of length 3. So see what I did? I multiply L1 with L2, and I end up in L3, right? So this is basically lead you to look at the graded rings. So graded rings is, are exactly like this. So let me just move on defining graded rings and then adopt a Levy path algebra as a graded ring. Okay. So just basics of graded rings. You can see this in all standard books. So the idea is that you start with the ring A. This is your ring A. And then if you're allowed, if you, it's possible to partition this into pieces, so if I would be able to partition this ring, and these indices are coming from some group. So these pieces, are in itself additive subgroups of A. So if you have two elements here and you add them, you are staying in the same partition, okay? But then, if you multiply this with this, so if you get a point here and multiply it with this, you end up with the next component, the next bit. So A alpha times A beta, you are ending, ending up here. Look at this. So I'm imitating that, okay? So if this happens, then I say A is a gamma graded ring. So definition. Let A be a ring and gamma and group. Then A is gamma graded if I can write A as a direct sum of these slices. These are these, these partitions where a alpha are sort of additive subgroups of A and this condition of A alpha, A beta, sitting A alpha plus beta, as you might expect. So, and the nice thing is that a lot of rings actually have this property. 
you're allowed to partition them. All right. Now, once you have this setting, then one of the things you can do is relate the zero part of the discoidate ring to the whole thing. So what I'm trying to say is that this is your A. Look at the zero part. Look here for any element coming from a group, you have this piece, right? This slice. So look at this slice which relates to a zero element of the group. Okay? So it's very easy to see that A0 is a ring. So of course if you add two things, you are still in here. But if you multiply two things in A0, look at this here. So A0 times A0 goes to A0. So this is a ring in itself. So inside A sitting is A0. And part of the graded theory is that is it possible or to investigate how much of this influence, how much of this ring influence the whole A? So a recipe really for cooking theorems is, is something like this theorem. Let lambda and gamma, this group, has some property, be some property. Then A0 has property P if and only if A has property P. So you see a lot of papers, quite valuable papers, that they say that if A0 has, so if gamma has some property, so not for any group, but some special group. And then a, if A0 has the property, you can actually lift the property to the whole ring. And this is good because oftentimes, if you recognize something is graded, A0 has much better behavior. So you just look at the A0, and if you're lucky, you can extend to the whole thing. The other recipe is theorem. Again, oftentimes, you have to have some condition on your group. Let me be a sum. Then, a has property P if and only if A has the same property graded version of that property. For example, you have the concept of Noetherian rings. You can define the concept of graded Noetherian rings. And if you put some condition of this indexing, then oftentimes if A has is Noetherian, then A is graded Noetherian and back home. And if you look at the literature, the good, the good groups are either finite groups, so you have a better chance of proving things in these two cases, or torsion free groups. I mean, there are a lot of rings that, when you look at them, you don't recognize they are graded. You, 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 it doesn't seem that you can partition them, but in reality, you can. But I want to mention a very nice book. You can read this um, as an entertainment, really. It's by Brovik. Let me see how to write this. Brovik. He's in Manchester. So it's called Mathematics on the Micro. Under microscope, and it's it's very interesting. It says that in fact, in elementary school, we work, we are working with graded rings, even in elementary schools. How? So it says that you know we have problems of this sort. Imagine you have ten apples, and then you give two apples to one each person, right? So you have ten apples. You distribute two to each person. So then the question is, how many people would get apples? So you say 10 apples divided by 2 apples, then 5 people would get. And it's interesting, in fact, it reminded me of my own problems then. So then the students get confused. You see here, you have apples, you divide these, suddenly people live here. Okay. So, and then he says in the book, okay, so then there are books that try to fix this, then they would say 10 apples 
divided by two apples per people, then that would be five people. So that makes better sense. And in fact, what you are doing here, you are working in a graded ring. So you are working in Z x x2 plus minus 1. And x1 is your apple, and x2 is your people. That's how basically you are working in a graded ring in the background. All right. So let me just give you some examples of a graded ring. And go from there. So the, the go to example, the, the sort of poster boy, is the screw rings. So here is gamma a group and k a field, or it could be a wing. Then the group ring k gamma is graded, and it's graded by that <coughs> gamma. And so I have to tell you now these partitions. So, and I'm sure you can guess. So I have to give you these partitions. Oops. It's just k alpha. And when you multiply k alpha and k beta, of course, you're in k alpha beta. So that's a gamma graded ring. But a much more interesting example is this one. So you start with any ring. I'm claiming that m n of a, so matrices, so it, this is just a square and you fill it with the elements of a, this is graded. So i.e., you have to give me these partitions now. So, is a z graded ring. So if somebody would give this to me, I would have not guessed how to partition this. But if there is a very natural way to break these matrices into pieces. And if I write it down, you'll see exactly how it works. So I have to give you, let me call it R. This is R would be this. So I have to give you this P0, R1, R2, and so on. So this is the distribution. R0 is everything on diagonals coming from A, the rest 0. <coughs> this is my R0. Then R, let's see, R minus 1 is 0. Below diagonal, just put A and everything 0. Then you got the idea. R minus 2 is, this is diagonal, this is the 1. Next to diagonal, now here you put A, and then everything is 0. And then R minus N plus 1 is A here, and everywhere else is there. So this is the partition. And then R1, we just do the same thing over the diagonal. And let me just tell you that this is one partition. There are many different ways you can split M N of A, which these slices would respect the multiplication. But this is a nice one. Uh, Rn is 0, so anything else, just the components are 0 here. So this is really enough case. So, you need to remember the construct construction of a group ring. So, the construction of a group ring is a direct sum of elements coming from here. So, this is the basis for your ring, and the elements are the sum of these here. Okay. So, an element of this is of the form of sigma ki, alpha i, alpha i are coming from gamma. So, these are the type of elements you are working with. So now I have to give you, remember that if you have A, I have to give you this slice. So the slice that I pick is all the coefficients and alpha. So now you have to check that K alpha. So you have to check that K alpha. Okay. It 
job is inside a And um, well, if it's a bit uh, not clear, so let's leave it as an exercise for the evening. Okay. Good. I have more. I mean, I just put here three some more recurrings. I'm not going to go through this, so maybe this evening. More recurrings. These are all uh, graded rings. So there are a lot of rings that you just look at it that they don't look graded, but they are actually they have some grading on them. Okay. So some very basic facts on graded rings, and I'm sorry if you have seen these, but just to remind others. Some language here, so to say a ring A, so the, the gamma graded ring A is concentrated in degree zero. If I just place the whole A you know, on the zero component and the rest zero. So that means that you can always make any ring a greatest ring. This is a very trivial matter. They also call it a trivial grading. Alright, so now this is the definition of the support. The support of A, and I don't think this is a standard notation, but let's just use that. The support of A are all the elements of the group such that this component is not zero. So can you tell me now what would be the support of a ring which concentrated in degree zero? Yeah, so A is concentrated in degree zero and only if this gamma A is zero. You can come up with examples that this gamma A is not a group. That's the first intuition. Usually one has the gamma A is a group, but it's not. And so let me just put a question here. And, and we can investigate that. Some of these questions, I don't know the answer. So that's the nice thing about it. So just some of the questions we can investigate afterwards. So one of them is that is a group. So this support is a group if I only give what? For example, here, as Suri mentioned, the support here, the support of this MN of A is not a group. It just starts from minus n plus 1, 0 goes to n minus 1. This is the same. Alright, the very basic proposition, so this would be usually the first proposition you would see in standard book, is that if you have a graded ring, Then you have, you can prove that the identity is always in A0. So the zero component always gets the identity. And let me just mention here, the, whole, the rings I'm talking about here are all associative and they have identity. First thing first. And then as you have guessed, this A0 is very special, it's in fact a sub-ring. Of A, the other ones, the other components are not subrings, they are not closed under multiplication, but they are by modules. <coughs> and I think you can check this in, in, in your head very quickly because if I multiply an element of this with this one, it's still in here from left and right. And because 
A is associative, it doesn't matter if I multiply from left and right, you always still have a point module. And the four, and these are, oops, three, four. You have to write a little to get the, the proof of some of these. This is one paragraph at least. So if you have an element in the alpha component, and this A is invertible, Can you guess what would be A inverse? Where, where would A inverse land? Yeah, so in the, this is the other side of it. So if this is A and get the inverse, you're flipping the whole thing to A minus, A minus one. And uh, just one more definition here, definition. So if you have two rings, and you have a homomorphism between these two rings, then I call F is graded homomorphism if, okay. Can you guess that one? It, it just has to respect the struct, these, these partitions, right? So if this is your A, and I just partition this A alpha, A beta, and so on, and this is your B, and this is also gamma graded, so this is B alpha, B beta, B, then this F, should send this to this, this to this, and this to this. If f of a alpha would be a And then if this f happens to be also bijective, if f is bijective, then these two rings are really the same they are graded isomorphic, and that's how we write it. That A and B are isomorphic as the rings, but not only that, they are graded, they are isomorphic as the graded ring. And this is the notation that A is isomorphic to B as the graded rings. Okay, so now, so as, as you see, the whole theory really is about partitioning and playing with the partitions. So as you, see, as you, you will see, the theme really is I get this partition and I move them around. And that gives you a lot of power because you have <coughs> access to each of these components. So let's do some, some more of this partitioning. So partitioning, partitioning of graded things. Not on the level of rings, that doesn't give you a homomorphism of rings, but on the level of modules you are, you're allowed to do that, so we get that. So you can shift the, the components, but that works much better on the level of modules. <coughs> Alright, so now, as usual, it's gamma great. And imagine that you have a homomorphism between two groups, gamma goes to delta, these are groups. Now I want to change the structure and, I make, and I'm going to make A a delta graded ring. So then A is also delta graded. So now I have to give you these components. And this is how it works. So uh, I delta. So now this delta is coming from delta is direct sum of f of mm. 
So let me explain. So look, um, this is your A. This is gamma, partitioned by gamma. So now this time I want to partition it with delta. So all these alpha, so I pick one alpha here. And all these alpha ones which goes to, sorry, all these gamma ones, gamma twos, gamma threes, which goes to alpha, I'm going to pick all these, and I call this new one A alpha. Right? So all these little gamma ones which goes to alpha, I'm going to collect the pieces and put them together. As you see, I'm coarsening, really, I'm coarsening the, the grading. So sometimes we lo lose information because. Previously, I had this much finer grading, and I'm just putting everything together. So that's one way to put a delta grading on A. So let me give you an example. This is a homomorphic. You need a homomorphism because you need to check that A alpha times A beta is in A alpha plus beta and then you use the multiplication. So, as a, uh, in particular here, if, if you are in this situation, and you know, I'm, I'm, through the whole lecture I'm working with a billion groups, so I don't need to worry about the normal subgroup. So these are the subgroups of here. This is your map. So I'm going to make A, previously was gamma graded. Now I'm going to make it gamma over omega graded. So I have to give you these pieces. And if you stare at this a bit more, you see that these are just all So I grab all the basically cosets and put all the slices together. In this way, A is a gamma over omega grade. So I, I have an example, suppose, just very quickly, and then we can work this out over the tutorial. So imagine A is separated. So then you have this A0, these are your components. And then I can make A three Z over 3 graded. Now I have to give you the components. So the component of 3Z plus 0 would be This one, this one. So these are the components of three z. So the components of three z plus one, maybe different color. Also, the alpha A0 is always A alpha. 
But if this happens for any component, then you call it a strongly graded ring. So definition A is gamma, strongly graded gamma ring. Strongly graded gamma graded if so previously A alpha times A beta would land in A alpha plus beta. It lands there, but I just want to say that now it recovers the whole A alpha plus beta. If that happens, then call it strong gradient. And it has really very nice properties. So if your ring has, is strongly graded, this is one place that you see that A0 has a lot of influence on A. Okay. Just because you can start with A0 and then you have somehow you can recover each of these components. More definitions, I call A, so this is definition one, two, A is called cross product. If it happens that in any component, you have one invertible element. So any slice you get, there isn't one invertible element in there. So if this one, can I write it this way? These are all the invertible elements. There is one always inside each component. Note that, note, in this case, in this case, if A is cross product, And gamma A is equal to uh, gamma A star equal. So let me just define what is gamma A star, which is related to the cross product. No, 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 no. I'm, I have to think about this. So gamma A star. I get all the components previously. Gamma A is all the elements from the index group such that this component is not zero. Now, the definition of here is that star is that all the elements this has an invertible element. So a gamma star is a group, and then, so this is always the case. This is always the case, and note that A is cross product if and only if gamma A star is gamma. So. Yeah, so any slice has been vertical. What's the motivation for the word cross product here? Mm -hmm. Why do they call it cross product? Because there is a complete structure theorem for cross product. It looks like, well, uh, there, there is this, uh, you come up with this gamma, gamma group, and there is an automorphism to, you have to construct all this, to A, and then A, is a direct sum or yeah so elements of a is elements of a are of this sort of uh, some field and these some basis of a you have to write this uh, such that when you multiply a and b when you multiply them this delta came into place something like that right there's a structure theorem that i have to think about this when you can you have to write a proof for it so there's a complete structure theorem which um, goes back to the standard cross product I'm really fine. But again, you have to write two, maybe two pages to get that cross product construction. And what? What is what is A star? A star are the invertible elements of A. So these are the set of all elements in A such that A B is B A. Uh, oops, A B is one. B A is one and B is an element of A. So it exists a B, just that A, B, and A, B, and B, and B. All right. 
So a very quick proposition. These are really not very difficult to prove. So A is gamma graded. First of all, A is strongly graded. So that's this definition. So either you have to check this, or you can check this one. If and only if you would be able to check that one is sitting in A half of A minus half. So instead of looking at all the components, you just concentrate on A half on A minus. If A is strong, um, yeah, stronger graded, then the support of A, and remember these are all the elements that the component is not zero, this has to be A, the gamma. Three, any cross product. is strongly graded. Let's understand this. So, remember cross product means that any component has an invertible element. Somehow you would be able to get this and prove that if you multiply the components, you recover the whole thing. And this is easy if you use one, right? Now, in the literature, but, but kind of this Cross product and stronger grade are very poor. So in the literature, people go, go through sort of a pain to produce examples of strongly graded which are not cross product. Okay? So cross product gives you strongly graded. But I challenge you to find strongly graded things which are not cross product. And then you'll see when I work with Levine path algebras, you can get a large class of Levine path algebras which are strongly graded, but not cross product. So it's very easy to produce examples there. So that was one of the main things Rango mentioned, that you can produce very nice examples. one more example of a ring which might not look like it has a um, grading, but in fact it has two different gradings, so you can partition it in two different ways. Okay, and that's this Hamiltonian division ring. And um, you know Hamilton comes from Ireland and he is in fact, the most celebrated Irish scientist. Okay, it's, it's like the Ramanujan version of Ireland. And you know, that's the true, true thing. Hamilton is very respected in, uh, in Ireland. And when he discovered this, so he was looking, uh, I'm sure you know the history. So this is the ring. So this is a division ring, that means each element which is not zero has an inverse. It's like a really like a field, but the elements would not commute. So when he discovered this is the first example of a division ring which was discovered. And when he discovered this, he was so excited he went out in Dublin and just uh, in a bridge wrote this formula. That, let me just write the formula that here I these, these are like complex numbers. So. So these are the relations. So, so he was looking at finding these relations for 15 years. I was looking at the, the history. So it took him 15 years to realize that these the relations he should put on that. So and he was so excited that he went in Dublin and just put on a bridge this this formula. Uh, so I used to live in Belfast for eight years, not very far from Dublin. So that's that's my contribution to that. <laughs> All right. So now, 
you can partition this. So this doesn't look like a graded dream, but it, it is in fact graded in two different ways. And I very quickly give you the gradings. So first of all, A is Z2 times Z2 graded. And by Z2, what I mean is really Z over 2 Z. So what are the partitions? I have to give you slices. So this is your R. This is this one. And it's a, uh, really a simple exercise to prove that when you multiply these, you end up in a right slice. I mean, if you multiply these with itself, you have, you have to end up here, because these are graded over z2 times z2. So that's one grading. And this is also z2 graded. Now this time, I pick two sort of isomorphic of complex numbers sitting in h. So I write h as a c0 plus c1, and then c0 is this complex number, numbers, and C1 is the, the, the rest of it. Again, you have to convince yourself that C1 times C1 is inside C0, and so on and so forth. One more example, and then maybe I'll yeah. break for, for coffee, and then we continue afterwards. So you have the graded version of all the, the standard definitions of rings. So we have fields, so we have graded fields. So the definition of a graded field or if you, in fact, graded division rings, so the definition of grade. So A is gamma graded as usual. Then I call A a graded division ring. If any non-zero element, any non-zero homogeneous element, so these are the elements coming from that components are invertible. And this is always the theme with grading. So previously, something is called a field if any non-zero element has an inverse, right? Here I'm saying that if you can break this into these components, and elements of here, not the whole thing, the elements you pick from the components have inverses. Then I call it graded field. Okay? So warning. <coughs> of course, if a field which is graded also is a graded field. So the graded field. is not necessarily And just the sort of standard example is same. So we, we are familiar with this Laurent ring. It's a ring because, for example, 1 plus x is not invertible. There's no way you can multiply this with something else and get 1. All right? But any element coming from the homogeneous fields are invertible. So this is a graded field. with the talk, talking about graded ideals and 
they are talking about greatest simplicity, simplicity, and so on and so forth. So just to recall that a great, so if i is an idea of, of a, is called greater if it is generated by homogeneous elements. There is not necessarily any, I don't, I don't know any sort of. The only thing is that each element of the component is here, unless you, I, I don't know anything here. Uh, all right, so now, the so if you become an ideal in A, which is generated by homogeneous element, I call it a graded ideal. So you can easily see that if I is greater, then it really sits inside the homogeneous width. So you can recover I as the sum of the components, and all these components are already sitting in I. All right, so if that happens, then you can easily see that A over I is also greater. And then when I, uh, I'm not going to write it, when, I, when we say, say a ring is graded simple, that means I'm focusing on graded ideals, and there would be no tri non trivial graded ideals. So a graded simple ring means that you have no trivial graded ideals. All right, should I? And maybe. Let me finish with one, one, one theorem. This is kind of non-trivial theorem, but that maybe proves my point that how you can move from grading to non-grading and back. So just one theorem. This is due to Jesper theorem. So let A be a gamma graded. And here, in the theorem, I really need gamma to be abelian. Remember that oftentimes to prove something, I have to put condition on the index group. So here, gamma is abelian. Then, A is simple. So no two-sided, no non-trivial two-sided ideals, if and only if. Can you tell me if A, if A is simple? Can you see that A is graded simple? Can you see that? Because the graded symbols, I really care about the graded ideals. Well, if A is simple, there, there are no ideals. So in particular, there are no graded ideals. So simplicity is graded simple. But if you have graded simple, there are rings that there are no graded ideals, but there are loads of ideals. One of them is this. Rango explicitly mentioned that the ideal generated 1, 1 plus x is an ideal, but you don't have any graded ideals. But this is a great theorem. It says that you can actually get A B simple out of this greater simplicity of A if the center of A, so these are the elements which commute with everything else, is a field. Very, very nice theorem. So as soon as you don't have any great ideals, and the center is a field, then A is a symbol. And when we go to the Levin path algebra, the first theorem proved there is when the great uh, when the Levin path algebra is simple. Now there are a couple of proofs, right, about the when the you know, Levin path algebra is simple. There are different approaches, but I think this would be a nice little even paper to prove that the Levin path algebra is simple going through this route. Okay, you want to prove that the path algebra is simple, you prove it is graded simple, and the center is filled. So what condition you have to have on the graph, on the graph that A 
is greater than simple that we know, and the train saturated, and Z of A is field. And that should be exactly the same condition that we have for simplicity. So moving towards proving the Lipkin's algebra is simple through this theorem. I haven't seen any approach, and I think it's a nice little. And then the final thing, maybe this is, and I just stop there. You can find the proofs in standard proofs. <coughs> if A is separated, so it's really nice. And the support of A. So the components which actually appear in A. The support is finite. Oh yeah. So then A is simple. So no ideals. If and only if A is graded simple. So as soon as the right, you are working with finite number of components, then simplicity and greater simplicity is really are the same concept. Let's let's continue. Thank you. The greatest symbol for the path algebra was you write it in terms of hereditary and saturated subsets. But that's true for simple, right? No, no. So you have to have hereditary and saturated subset, and then you have to have that each cycle has an exit. So you have to have an extra condition. Do this repeat what you have written there means after this theorem, uh, what condition about that? After this theorem? Yeah, so look, I mean just a little, little suggestion that there are different ways to... Yeah. Say again. For least simple ring. For least simple ring. Right. That's good. It's a graded field. If A is a graded symbol, the center is a graded field. If A is a simple, yeah. If A is simple, then the center is a field. If A is a graded symbol, then the center is a graded This is not a question. It is a Oh, so yes, yes. So, so this is the what he wrote on that bridge. Yeah. And I don't know if you can see it. The bridge on which uh, Hamilton has engraved this. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. So there's a Hamilton walk, actually. Uh, I, I forgot, like no, November's fifth or something. That they walk exactly. Do you have that? No. Do they, come, do they go through every part of they go through the parts that we walk that day. Because he, he went to that bridge, he wrote it down, then he went to a church, he told some people that he knows there, and then he went to some academic's house. And so there's Hamilton Walk. <coughs> um, I just wanted to ask, how well does all of those work for non-unital rings? Um, like, for example, that criteria for strongly graded, where we require one, is there a version for non-unital rings? All right. So, first of all, for non-unical, the definition of strongly graded, you can just write it as it is. So I approach the definition of strongly graded this. But then there was one theorem that says that if one happens to be in here, then it's strongly graded. Now, if there is non-unital, you don't have this. But in often, oftentimes you have rings with local units. Then I think I, I think this is not very difficult. Then you have to check that your local units have to be here. Then A becomes strong ring. So this is the test you make. But uh, you're right. I think somebody has to go through this whole concept and write this world thing with graded rings with local units and just systematically put. I mean, for example, this stuff I. 
I mean, this would be a very nice project. Somebody write this on the level of rings with local units, because these are all for rings with units. And I would imagine you just have to go through the proof carefully and you know, just do these tweaks. <coughs> So if there are no further questions, we can thank our speaker once more.